Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. I'm here joined by Sean Frank, who's CEO of Looking Glass. Now you guys came last year to show off a, a volumetric display called Volume. Mm -hmm. You guys have been experimenting a lot with different types of holographic displays, right? Yeah, um, Looking Glass is formed to chase the dream of the hologram, which is, uh, in our definition, a uh, way for folks without headgear to interact with three-dimensional worlds. Mm -hmm. And Volume was one incarnation of that, where we had a three-dimensional world that was trapped in a block of glass. But the dream of the hologram requires that you, at some point, touch the hologram itself, and that's what Holoplayer does. So this is Holoplayer. Tell me what it's about. It, uh, I mean, I, it's tough to show people out there on a, on a 2D screen in a 2D YouTube video, uh, but what's the experience supposed to be like? Um, so it's a super stereoscopic, auto stereoscopic interface, meaning that you can see a three-dimensional world floating above the glass right here without headgear on, without VR or AR headgear on, and you can interact with that floating hologram. It's not really a hologram, it's a light field that's generated above this glass, but it feels like what the holograms in movies are presented to be. And it totally is effective. Now, when you brought this in, I thought it was gonna be like a Pepper's Ghost, like a, like those classic arcade machines where you see a floating hologram behind a sheet mm. of glass, but you're doing, you're somehow putting it in front of the glass. How's that done? The first step is we make a super stereoscopic image of 32 views down here in the base of the hollow player. And then to do what you're getting at of pulling it above the glass, we bounce that screen off of a beam splitter, bounces off of a retroreflecting film, and then that original super stereoscopic image in the base of the hollow player is regenerated up here in, in space above the glass itself, letting you interact comfortably through the floating scene, the floating 3D scene. There's a couple things going on there. We'll no, start okay. with like what you're doing with the image, because the image here you're running is basically an application in, in Unity, what you guys were doing with uh, right. the volume. Right. And with, even with volume, we were, you were splitting up an image into multiple sections for depth. Here you're splitting it up almost like a, like a lenticular display, yep. like if you hold one of those trading cards or those books, and you can view it at different angles. For that, it's a flat image, like a static image, but still the idea of cutting up, or Nintendo 3DS, yeah, yeah. for example. So yep. you basically have a 2K Nintendo 3DS type display underneath? Yeah, um, the difference between um, the super stereoscopic screen we make in Hollow Player and the 3DS, is the 3DS just generates two views, mm -hmm. um, and those are sort of locked to one individual as um, he or she moves around. Um, we're generating 32 views, sort of fanned out in a 50 degree zone, meaning that someone standing over here in front of the hollow player sees one portion of the three dimensional scene and another person standing next to him sees another um, view of that three dimensional scene. Right, you actually get to look around the objects, right. which in multiple can share the experience yeah. at once. Now then to get that super stereo image floating here, how does that work? Um, so uh, in the old days, you would have done this with a huge quarter spherical mirror or double parabolic mirror. Um, I don't know if, if um, you or any of the viewers have seen this trick with um, the Mirage toy, where you have a parabolic mirror here and another parabolic mirror here and you kind of float a penny. Um, right. This is how folks used to what they call re-image um, information. Um, but you would need huge optics. In order to do that with Hollow Player in a small compact system, um, we use a retroreflecting re-imaging circuit, um, which really is just a fancy way of saying we take the screen that's down here and re-image it and refocus it up here um, above the glass by bouncing it a few times um, between some optical films. And that optical film has to be highly reflective, highly directional, so you don't get diffusion, you actually get focus, and so you can actually pinpoint it to a space that's not there or there, but here. Yes, it refocuses um, at a particular plane in space. Uh, what it made me think of is like holding like a really shiny spoon. Yeah, yeah. Like looking at a spoon and sometimes it looks like a reflection is floating in front of that concavity. Yeah. But as opposed to having something super concave and scaled up, it's pretty compact relatively. It looks like it's like flat in the back there. Yeah, the film at the back, um, the retroreflector film, um, actually has millions of tiny little, what they call corner cubes. Mm. And that's what focuses the, the light back onto this um, aerial plane. Is that similar to what some people like Cast AR was using, like with like the really uh, reflective 
materials that you'd find on stop signs or even you know evening you know uh, bicycle jackets. Yeah, so Cast AR um, would take a retroflector film and blanket it onto a surface or a wall, and then they would have pico projectors that would shine out, and the retroflecting film would then shine back into your eyes. Yeah. Um, because we are sort of dogmatic about non-headgear systems, um, we are using a retroflector film, but um, are refocusing it in a way that doesn't require you to have the pico projectors mounted into a headset. Hmm. And experience, like I said, is convincing. It's also interactive. So notice on top here, you have, looks like a stereo system. Uh, it's for tracking. What are you tracking? Yeah, so we're tracking all your fingers um, here, and you can actually see a uh, little circle following my finger probably in the in the video and it lets you draw and sculpt uh, you know and interact with three-dimensional worlds um, with just your hand so we're tracking your fingers and the idea is that this is a, a dev kit so you want people to start creating things can you import models into unity and just do as a viewer model is the most simplistic thing yeah super super simple for anyone that uses unity um, obviously there are uh, already a couple dozen apps and there'll be more for folks that want to experience what it's like to um, play around with holographic applications um, if they don't know Unity. But if you do know Unity, there's an SDK called Holoplay that lets you, in about five minutes, take something you created in Unity and pull it into the real world. So with that canvas of this field of view, this dimension, you can make little games that you can actually interact with, you know, draw shapes navigate a maze or something. Yeah, and if you already have something that you made for a VR, AR, mm -hmm. um, or you know, um, any sort of platform, you can drop our hollow play sort of um, rectangle over top of that game and boop, it appears in the hollow fire. So you guys are very forward thinking, or you guys started with literally stacks of sheets of glass, oh, right? Right? Yeah. right, to create some type of 3D holographic image. Now you're working with light. Uh, how does this scale? Like, what ways are you already thinking about things to, to improve uh, as cost reduction happens for things like the, the screen or as you get better reflective materials? Sure. Um, so the Hollow Player One is the first dev kit of its kind that lets people start to, what we call the hologram hackers of the world, um, which the folks in Looking Glass and I uh, consider ourselves to be. Um, uh, it lets us start to actually create applications and share them between systems that other people in the world have. Um, but in order for this to make the leap into most people's homes and hospitals and schools, probably needs to get about twice as big so that you have a comfortable view zone for dozens of people rather mm -hmm. than just um, a few folks. Um, and the sharpness of the aerial image um, needs to increase. That probably means a 4 or 8K screen instead of the 2K screen at the back. Um, and also the retroflector film will become higher grade. Uh, really over the next year or so. Is that, I mean, that's soon. Does that mean that it's something that you can really swap out parts? Like if those yeah. parts were readily available or cheaper, it'd be easy to swap out this screen here with bigger screen, higher resolution, and it would just work? Yep, absolutely. Wow. And same with the retroflective material. As those get better defined and cheaper, you can just put make this bigger yep. and, and create that wider field of view. Yep. So it's truly thought out to be scalable. Yeah, we imagine that this is going to be um, the system that sort of spills a hologram out of people's walls in their homes and up out of the tables uh, in schools and hospitals and you have a floating CT scan of a heart or whatnot. Um, and this is just a first step in that direction. But the, the device itself, we believe, will also start to disappear and merge into um, you know, people's everyday lives. So form factor wise, obviously you need a distance for it to refocus. Like how compact and, and how integrated do you imagine a system like this being? Like what other tricks could you do to even make it more compact? So the, um, the next step will probably just be simply um, twice as big, mm -hmm. um, maybe a year or so from now, uh, depending on what the hologram hacker community creates over the next six months. Um, and then beyond that, there's some uh, ideas in the pipeline about how we can make um, the system not scale volumetrically as the screen, si the screen size scales. Okay. And that's what's necessary to have sort of the her or minority report, full size human being coming out of the wall, really needs to fit into the, the drywall right. um, of, uh, of a wall. And, and that is totally possible to do. That's super cool. And so you guys are launching this as a dev kit. It's on your website. Um, when do you guys plan on shipping these? Um, we're gonna, for folks who really want them fast, we'll have a few dozen that'll be shipped um, by uh, December 20th. 
So folks will get them by Christmas. And then for everyone else that gets the systems, um, they'll ship early April. And hopefully you guys get to see this in person. You guys are still going to make to Maker Fairs and, yeah. and their events? Just, just showed this at Maker Fair in New York. And anyone can come by our labs in Brooklyn or Hong Kong. And uh, we'll have these set up in a few places around the world, too. It's super cool. You guys should definitely go find a place to check it out in person. Sean, thank you for stopping by our offices and showing us Hollow Player. It's a pleasure to see you again. And yeah, I'm Thanks. to see you next. Thanks for having us.